Hello there! Welcome to lecture six. Uh, you might be doing something else this week, but if you're watching this lecture, welcome back. I'm looking outside my window right now, and I see a truck, and the door is open, but I can't see the person inside of it because it's like a dark window. But under the door, like on the ground, there's like two red shoes that are really bright red that look like Crocs, you know, and then I have like white socks under them. So it looks like a truck ran over Ronald McDonald. It's just sitting there outside my window. So today we're talking about Roth IRAs. We've talked about IRAs before a little bit, but what makes the Roth so special, you might ask yourself, or Ronald out there might ask himself. Well, I'm glad you asked because it's going to be the secret to your future retirement. Well, okay, it's one part of your future retirement, right? It's not the secret. Uh, and it has some advantages of a traditional IRA. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And then also go back to Robin Hood a little bit. The great appeal of the Roth IRA is that it builds tax-free retirement wealth, right? Okay, we know that. It saves money for you. It gives you a place to invest money so you can retire. But did you know it also serves as an emergency savings system right now. So it helps your future self, it helps your present self at the same time. And that's pretty crazy, right? Because most of the time we're talking about investors, we're talking about the long haul down the road. Some days will be useful to me, but I can't have it right now, right? Present self has to suffer, so future self has the benefit. Well, with a Roth IRA, the promise is a little bit different. Future self and present self get in on the action. And that is pretty special. We talked about this last week a little bit, like talking about emergency funds and how important it is to have that free loan you can give yourself when you can't cover your expenses. Well, the nice thing is that's sort of built into the Roth IRA. So let's say that you have some options here, right? If you have a 401k that's offered through your employer, that's a great place to put your money. You should put your money there, right? Especially if your employer is matching you, put your money in the 401k first. And you can put up to about 20K a year into a 401k until you make over a certain amount of money. So do that first, okay? If you have a 401k, it's a possibility. Or if you have a 403b, that's a possibility, which is a similar thing, except instead of coming from you know, your private employer, it's usually coming from a public employer, education or whatever. If you have one of these options, 401k, 403b, put money into that first, okay? Especially if there's a match, get that free money first, absolutely. And then, beyond that, you might want to start an IRA because an IRA you can put $6,000 worth in every year and it's one more investment vehicle. You have to run it, right? You manage it, but it can be as set and forget as you want it to be. But anyway, if you contribute to one of these things, the 401k, the 403b, the traditional IRA, they contribute to lowering your taxable income each year, which is great because it means I don't pay as many taxes. And I love that, right? Um, money grows in those accounts tax deferred as well, which is also great, which means if I put money aside, you know, during a calendar year into one of these accounts, I not only can save that money without it being taxed until I pull it out, but I also get a tax deduction in the year that I'm doing it potentially. You do pay the taxes someday though. When I withdraw that money from that account, when I actually retire, I have to pay whatever tax bracket I'm in right? Because it counts as income. And if I withdraw too early, I also have to pay penalties on that and usually lose a big chunk of it. So if I'm willing to forego that sort of year to year tax benefit, I might consider looking at a Roth IRA. Now, the nice thing about the Roth IRA is once again, it promises tax deferred growth. However, it doesn't give me a tax deduction in the year that I do it. So if this year I put a thousand dollars into a 401k, or a traditional IRA, I could deduct that money on my taxes. If I put that thousand dollars into a Roth IRA, I can't deduct that money this year. But the good news is if I leave it in there until I retire, it grows tax deferred and it's not taxed at the end. Ah, right, which is great. So if, especially if you're gonna be in like a higher tax bracket at the end of your career, which is possible than you are currently, um, a traditional IRA is gonna be taxed at that higher number right? Which doesn't happen to everybody, but it could tax you pretty hard. A Roth IRA says whatever tax bracket I'm in at the end, it doesn't matter because I'm pulling it out tax 
free, and that's glorious, right? So a traditional IRA gives you an advantage now. It like helps you save for your future self, you make your contribution, you get the income tax deduction today. So it helps your future self, it helps your present self, which is cool, with a tax deduction, nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with a traditional IRA, right? If you have one, totally fine. But the nice thing with the Roth IRA helps your future self save money tax deferred, helps your future self not have to pay taxes, but I don't get the advantage, you know, of a tax deduction this year, right? Well, okay, but if you can live without that tax deduction right now, you can add an even nicer present to your future self and your present self as well. So the nice thing with tax deferred earnings, no matter what they're in, like if they're in a 401k, 403b, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, whatever the vehicle they are, is that you're not getting assessed taxes each year on what that account is doing, right? How that account grows. If I buy a share of Apple this year and then it goes up, you know, and it's worth $20 more next year, I'm not paying taxes each year on that $20 it went up, right? I'm only paying at the very end when I pull my whole account out, when I retire, right? Unless I withdraw it early and then I'm paying taxes. So if I put $1,000 into my Roth, right? I don't pay taxes on that amount this year. If I put it into a traditional savings account though, you might have to pay taxes on that. Although, you know, honestly, if you somehow get that kind of percentage increase from a savings account, please tell me where you bank because that would be amazing, right? Uh, in my savings account, I get like 0.001% growth or something. So I technically do pay taxes on it each year, but it's a pretty minor amount, right? <laughs> uh, tax deferred growth can lead to bigger benefits down the road. So a couple of terms you know, to remind yourself of. One is principal, right? Principal is the amount of money you deposit into one of these retirement accounts. And then the earnings is the money that is generated within the account based on the principal you put in, right? So if I put in $50 into a 403B account and bought one share of, what's like a $50 stock? Like Nintendo, maybe, I don't know. It's like 60 bucks. Anyway, I bought a share of that. That's my principal. The money I put in, I bought that share. Right. Or maybe I put in $100 to buy part of a mutual fund. Right. I bought one share of a mutual fund for $100, has lots of different stocks in it. Well, over the year it generates some money and by the next year it's worth $110. So suddenly $10 is my earnings and the principal is still the 100 I put in. Okay. So with the Roth IRA, there's three different ways that you can withdraw that money. And the thing that is magical about the Roth IRA that is not true of any of those other accounts we've been talking about not the traditional IRA, not a 401k, not a 403b, is that with a Roth IRA, you can take out the principal at any time after you funded the account. So if I put in $100, got a share of a mutual fund, it made $10 in the next year, I can pull out that $100 that I put in. So I could like sell that mutual fund share, right? Pull out the 100 and I still have $10 in there that was generated. That's still in the account, tax deferred. And I get that $100 back to use if I need it. Look at that, we just build an emergency account that is also a long-term savings account. Now, it's a little tricky here because you obviously don't wanna pull out all the money in the account or that would be penalized, right? You can't go beyond the principal you put in. Just because my 100 made $110 or made 10 more dollars, doesn't mean I can pull out $110 without it penalty. However, if my withdrawal qualifies, I can pull out that $110. If I can't, then I'm paying some sort of penalty on that. So let's say, for example, you know, I, uh, I have an emergency that comes up. So I've already funded my Roth IRA for this year. Remember, you can only put in $6,000 a year currently. Um, and let's say I put that money in the account this year. And now I've got an emergency. I've got a problem. Like I need to bring it out. For whatever reason, bring out as much as I can, right? Well, again, I can take that out penalty free. So if I put in, let's say I put in $10,000 and that 10,000 has made another $3,000 because I'm just like cooking, right? Well, I can't pull out all $13,000 that I need or that I have in the account, but I can pull out the $10,000 that I put in, right? This is over more than one year because you can't put in 10 in one year. And so I still have the interest that was made 
And maybe I'm not pulling out the entire principle, right? But as long as I'm pulling out less than the entirety of the principle, I'm okay. So that's great. I have an emergency fund. Of the money that I put in, almost all of it I can pull back out at any time. I can't pull back the earnings that I'm making on it, but I can pull back the original principle. So hopefully you don't have to withdraw money early. Hopefully you don't have an emergency that involves that. But there could be other reasons you withdraw early, and some of them are not actually penalized and not taxed. So for example, if you do reach 59 and a half years old, you know, you're in the money. But let's say you don't get that far. Or let's say that you're disabled, you qualify as disabled, that means you can distribute things early. But let's say you don't qualify as disabled and you're not 59 and a half, you can also pull out up to $10,000 of funds, regardless of how much of that is principal, to purchase a first home. So it can become a savings account, not just for an emergency fund, it could also become like a house savings account, which again is not something you can do with a 401k. Because a 401k, if you try to take out that money early to buy a home, you're paying a lot of penalty money on that, right? And you're paying taxes on that. Now, the catch is the Roth IRA has to have been open at least five years to do this, okay? So if you want to buy a house next year, this isn't going to help you very much. But if you're like, oh, I might buy a house in five or six years, putting money into that IRA can actually become your house piggy bank, as well as your emergency fund, as well as your retirement fund. That's like three things it's doing now, right? And then there's also non-qualifying distribution. So if you really need to withdraw more money, you know, than you can do without penalty, that's okay. Um, but you're going to have to pay income taxes on that and you have to pay a 10% penalty as well. So if you're not old enough to retire, um, you don't qualify otherwise, you're not putting it towards a house, but you still need your money back, you can take it out. But remember, you're losing 10% of that value, which could be a significant sum. And you're paying income taxes on that as income for that year. So don't do that unless it's an absolute emergency, right? At that point, it's probably cheaper to get a loan somewhere else, depending on how much money you're going to lose on penalties. So traditional IRAs are not as flexible as Roths, right? Roths can be used as a piggy bank for lots of things. Traditional IRAs, not so flexible. You get that tax, ben tax benefit each year, but, you know, <coughs> excuse me, there is a cost involved. Um, if you withdraw from a traditional IRA, it's going to be taxable. If you do it early, it's going to be taxable and you're going to get penalized unless you qualify based on age, being 59 and a half, or qualify as disabled, or the account owner has died, and so this is being distributed elsewhere. Or, again, for a first-time home purchase up to $10,000, you can actually get some help from your traditional IRA as well, not just Roth. Um, for qualified higher education expenses, so if you want to go back to school and it qualifies, or to purchase medical insurance if you're unemployed, which is pretty sad if you have to cash out your retirement to pay for medical insurance while you have no job. So try not to do that unless you absolutely have to, but if you do, it won't be penalized. So Roth IRAs do a lot. Traditional IRAs do a lot too, but Roth IRAs are sort of even more flexible, right? They have those sort of three possibilities and not just one or two. So the earlier you begin, again, giving yourself five years for that house fund, if that's your goal, the better off you're gonna be. And in the long run, you might even save on taxes, depending on where you're at at the end of your career. So what's the problem? Why don't you have one? Maybe you do have one. If you do, good job. Uh, I finally opened one a few months back, so good job me. Well, you might not have opened it because you might not have any money to put in yet. You might not have any earned income. Or you might just be debating trying to figure out what's the best thing to do. There's always this conflict, you know, between like, what do I need right now? What do I need later? Like, how do I set aside money now when it's more likely I need money now than later in some ways? Well, research tells us a little bit about this, right? Like, why are these decisions hard to make when it comes to that long-term savings and retirement and um, planning? Douglas Hershey and a few others did some research into this and looked at what factors motivate us to save retirement and which ones don't. Um, so one thing that helps people save for retirement is having what's called a future time perspective. So those people who are sort of better able to look into the future can save more than others. What does that mean? Those people that really identify with their future selves, right? They say, no, I will be that person someday. That person needs me to work for them. The other people that have success with this are people who have a really clear goal of retirement, right? Without a clear retirement goal, like when and where and how and how much, it's pretty hard to save the right amount. 
right? If you say, well, I'm going to retire in Tahiti and I really want to find a way to pay for that, you know, it actually makes you more likely to do it. People who have knowledge of financial planning and are actively invested in it, <laughs> or engaged in it, I should say, uh, do much better actually at financial planning as well. Big shock there, right? So the more you're interested in your own finances and your future, the more you're likely to plan well for your future. And also people who perceive that they don't have enough savings, which is really interesting. Um, how much you believe you have saved compared to others will affect how much you do save for retirement. So you have to kind of believe that you don't have enough, but that it's possible to get enough. It's also interesting. But we also have problems with risks, not just looking forward, right? So Ricky Wong did some studies into this as well and found out that saving strategies tend to correlate to people's risk-taking behaviors, which kind of makes sense because savings are sort of the other side of risk, right? The buffer against risk. So risk-averse investors, people who don't want to take a lot of risks, obviously look into low-risk investments. Now, the only problem with low-risk investments, they tend to have sort of a low payoff and low long-term usability. Because remember I mentioned my savings account, which gets me like 0.03% interest or something each month. Now that's super safe because it's backed by the government. You know, there's no, it's not going anywhere. You know, that money is not actually changing value technically. Well, it's in the account even though it is, right? Um, and so it's super safe, but the price of safety is that I don't really make any money on it, right? It's being held safely it will never be enough to retire on because it's not compounding interest in a way that will get me anywhere close to retirement. On the other hand, there's crypto, right? And NFTs and all this other stuff. That's like, wow, this is a huge gamble because tomorrow this could become worthless. It also could be the ladder to retiring early. You know, like it's, it's extremely risky, but the price of that risk is potentially huge reward or worthlessness, right? But if you're risk averse, you'd say, wow, I really don't want to put my IRA into crypto, which, you know, admittedly, you probably shouldn't, or at least not all of it, um, maybe some of it. But if you move so far over that you're like, I don't want to take a chance even on a mutual fund or something, right? I just want to put my money into bonds. It's like, okay, but you can't retire on that, right? So one fix to that is to get perspectives besides your own. Like talk to people at different stages of their careers. What did they invest in when they were younger? What do they invest in now? You know, how has their idea of risk and benefit changed over time? What's the smartest possible investment? Obviously, uh, for Homer, it's retirement Greece, right? It's Willie's retirement Greece, eventually that does it. Uh, so establishing a Roth IRA, first you gotta meet the basic requirements. Must have earned income, okay? and you can't contribute more than your earned income, all right? So that means if you have no job, you can't actually open an IRA. However, if you have no job, but your spouse has a job and they have enough earned income to cover the amount that you're investing, you can contribute. Not to your spouse, but you actually contribute to your own IRA with your spouse's income. So that's great, another good reason to get married. You can use their money. Now, the second piece here is you can only contribute up to $6,000 a year. Now, this will go up in the future slowly, but for now, still 6 k So even if you earn much more than that, you know, 6 k a year. So also be careful about where you invest it because it's not like you can just, you know, pile in more money <laughs> to make up for lost money. It's like that's the six grand you have each year to do some damage out there, right? So make sure it's somewhere it's going to be effective. And note that that $6,000 is across all of your IRA accounts, okay? Now it's not your 401k and it's not your 403b, but it's all of your individual accounts, right? So you're, if you have a traditional IRA and you put 3,000 into that and you have a Roth IRA and you put 3,000 into that, you're maxed out for the year, okay? However, if you're over the age of 50, you can add $1,000 to the annual limit. Make it an even seven grand. So the third piece of establishing a Roth IRA is that you can have, they can be sort of holding whatever vehicles of investment that you want, right? They can have all kinds of different funds in them, whatever it is, it's up to you, but you have to choose it, right? That's the only tricky thing. And you can have as many different IRAs technically as you want. 
it's just it's impractical after a while to have one after another after another after another right especially because the limit across them all is six thousand so be aware of that um, you do need to have an adjusted gross income of less than one hundred twenty five thousand dollars if you're filing as a single person or you can use a reduced amount up to 140k at which point you can't use them anymore these are not supposed to be like tax avoidance vehicles for rich people but they find creative ways, ways around that anyway. If you want to open an IRA, it's pretty easy. You can go to a bank, go to a credit union, you can go to a financial institution of any sort, you can go to a brokerage online, you don't have to talk to anyone if you don't want to. Um, and you basically just say, I want to open this and here's my information and here's where I'm going to fund it from, like from the bank, whatever. And then once the money is in the account, you decide where it's going to go. Like, how do I want these funds to be invested? Now. You'll have a ton of choices about where these funds get invested. You can put them into bank products like certificates of deposit. You can put them into mutual funds, right? Groups and groups and groups of different stocks and all that. You can put them into ETFs if you want, uh, which are traded on exchanges, right? But it's kind of like a mutual fund. You can put them into stocks if you just want to like really bank on one specific company. You can put them into bonds if you really like not making money. Uh, you got lots of options, right? And so you might want a mix of these things to kind of think about where is my risk going to lie. Um, but think about this chart. If you're really far from retirement, it's okay to be a little riskier with your investments. If you're buying bonds and you're not going to retire for 30 or 40 years, why are you buying bonds, right? Like the stock market is going to tank, but then it's going to recover and it's going to tank and it's going to recover. And it's going to have tons of time to be up massively by the time you actually retire, right? So at least get some mutual funds. Just don't only buy bonds, okay? Buy a few stocks. I don't know which ones though, or I'd be buying them. But think about your own risk-taking tendencies, what makes the most sense. Some of these are insured and some of these are not, so be aware of that as well. Sometimes, you know, you just wanna buy a target date fund like this and say, I'll just put my money into this. Somebody else will manage it. They'll adjust it over time expecting that when I get close to retirement, I want to be in sort of safer, slower funds. Um, that's an option as well, right? Just think about like your level of risk, your level of involvement, but even if you just want to set it and forget it, you can totally do that, right? You can open the IRA, you can say, I just want, you know, this chunk of the S&P, and every year I'm going to throw more S&P in there or whatever it is. And it's like, great, that's the whole market. Like, it's just gonna chug along slowly upwards. That's better than nothing, right? That's better than sticking in your savings account and you never have to think about it. So something to consider. Now, once you open it, you do have to fund it. So you can either write somebody a check or more likely you'll do an electronic payment and say, here's my routing number, you know, here's my account number to the bank, and have them send it directly over. So that whatever's in my savings account will end up in my IRA. And then once it's there, they tell you like, this is from Fidelity and they say, okay, here's your contribution limit, you know, and here's how much you put in. And it's like, oh, great. So I have a good idea of like, this is what I've put in, this is what I'm investing. And then how much room do I have before the end of the year to put in more? It is a good idea to max out your contributions every year because again, you can't go back in time and do that later. You can't really catch up very well. Um, so even if you're struggling, like if you can force 6K in each year, that's a huge payoff down the road. Withdrawing money is pretty simple as well. Um, if your Roth IRA is with an investment company, which it will often be, like a lot of online brokerages, pretty commonplace to have an IRA, um, it'll take a little time sometimes to send the money back and forth. Which means you might, you know, hopefully be careful. You don't want to withdraw unless you really need to withdraw, because especially because you don't want to be penalized. But even if you're just taking out principal from a Roth IRA, you want to make sure you really need it. Because otherwise, you know, you're sort of undoing the future investment piece of it. Um, however, if you need cash immediately, that can be a little tougher, right? Like you need at least a few days usually to be able to get your money back out. So be aware of that. Um, and just remember that every investment you make is a risk, but also every investment you don't make is a risk, right? Like putting all your money into a savings account is a massive risk and probably a disaster because it'll never become enough money to retire on, on its own. It needs to be invested in some way. But how it gets invested is up to you. Whatever risk you take on is up to you because I can't tell you what level of risk you can tolerate without losing your mind, right? So make sure you're listening to as much objective advice as possible. Where are you gonna find that though?
Well, one problem is we don't really look at risk objectively in general. Um, and that's because our intuitions are not right on. System one is not perfect, okay? And so system one says, ah, I really feel like this money, you know, it's gonna be well invested here. I think it's gonna go up. I think we're in good shape, right? But what's that based on? Like, I have a good feeling about this company that turns out could crash, you know, and split in half in the next few weeks for all I know, right? Like, what, what is this based on? If it's based on objective facts, if you're actually doing the research and trying to figure out objectively where is a good place to store my money, if you're asking experts for those same answers, or if you're looking at, you know, a heuristic helps you solve a problem and find out what's a good investment, that's great. Um, and if not, that could be a problem. But the trouble is system one doesn't often wait for that. Here's an example for you. I want you to see what your tuition or your intuition does with this one. So here's an example. Let's say that there's somebody named Julie and she is a senior at OSU, oh, much like you. She reads fluently, that's great, but she even read fluently when she was four. Wow, that's pretty impressive. What is her GPA? If you had to guess, you know, at four, she was a really fluent reader. Now she's 21 or 22. What do you think her GPA is in college? Well, system one will give you an answer. It'll find a causal link between those two things, reading at a young age and current college GPA. However, it's not very good at distinguishing like, well, are these relevant details to each other, right? It'll give you an answer, but it can't actually evaluate that answer and say, this is a good answer. So what it's really doing is it's thinking about norms. It's like, what do I expect? What is the reference group? Where is this coming from? Who am I standing against? Because I think the norm is, oh, children at four years old can't read fluently or many children at four years old do not read fluently. That usually comes later. So if she does, she must be a better reader than her classmates. And being a better reader than her classmates might translate down the road to being a better student, getting into better schools, ending up in a better college, or just doing better in college in general, right? So we have to think about who's the reference group. And then we have to think about who else goes to college. Well, lots of other kids. And is Julie better than all those kids? Maybe, but maybe all those kids in college could read it for, right? So who's our reference group? So system one says, I'm not really sure about that. Instead, it just does a substitution and matches intensities. So it says, four-year-old reading a lot. That's a really good reader. It's a high intensity level. So in college, she must still be a good student and a good reader high intensity level, let's say high GPA, right? System one can do those cross comparisons, but does that give us actual data for predicting, right? And you can see how this works when you start thinking about investing. It's like, just because I like this company and I know it exists and other people seem big on it and it seems undervalued, does that mean all those things are actually true? I don't know, right? So you need system two to come in and say, well, hang on a minute. These predictions, these risks, these you know, evaluations might not actually be correct. Step two can come in and say, hey, your reference category is wrong. Maybe all these other kids read it for who ended up in college with Julie, right? Or maybe the evidence we have is not very good. Like maybe it was her mother that thought she could read fluently. And in fact, she really didn't read that well then, misremembering or something, right? Like you could evaluate all the evidence as well, but it takes effort to do that. System two has to do that. It's not automatic. And we don't do it for most of our intuitions. We don't stop there and interrogate and say, well, is that really what's happening? It's very complicated to use this sort of system to address our intuitions. And so the end result is we don't always make the best predictions, right? And system two struggles too, because it's trying to be rational, but it can't predict the outliers that we end up noticing most of all, the things that end up being the most important because it only guesses what's standard. So what can you do? Well, you can follow System 2's advice when making safe investments, but you can also let System 1 gamble once in a while because often it's just as good at guessing as System 2 is. Think about it this way. Think about venture capitalists. Like, how do they know where to put their money? Well, they know that most startups actually end up failing. Their job is simply to call more winners than losers, right? Like, they make money if they find the winners. So it doesn't matter if they lose some, as long as they eventually win enough, right? You only need one winner that wins really big to make up for all these losers. So they learn to limit their losses when something is going down and find more winners. 
Like they end up taming the black swans. So how do you correlate better? How do you predict better? Well, you have to apply correlation coefficients. So if we go back to Julie, we can think about what her GPA might be in college. And you might have estimated maybe she has a 3.0, right? Or 3.5 or 2.5 or whatever. Just whatever your prediction is. Then we might think, well, what's, what is our impression, you know, of that versus the average GPA? So maybe we think, oh, she has a 3.5, and let's say the average in this college is like 2.5, right? So now you have a difference of impression. A 3.5, you know, impresses upon me how different it is than a 2.5. So then I can think, well, how does that correlate to be able to read at an early age? And I could say, oh, well, there's some correlation coefficient there. There's some connection between the two. And if we actually research it, it turns out there's a 0 0.30 correlation coefficient, which is, you know, a relationship, not the biggest relationship. Um, and then we shift our guess accordingly. So if I thought average GPA is 2.5, I'm guessing she has a 3.5. We know there's a 0 0.30 correlation coefficient, then maybe I'm shifting 0.3. Maybe she's got like a 3.2 or something, right? So in that case, I'm using my intuition still, but then I'm correcting it with what I know about the real world. Right? So system one and system two, when they're working together, end up actually solving some of these problems of working alone. And also keep in mind, we talked about this before, but regression to the mean is a thing. Right? Intuition gets curbed by that. Things go back to normal at some point. Like we might think, oh, Julie's so smart as a four-year-old, doesn't mean she hasn't actually regressed back to the mean by the time she's in college, right? Can we really assume that she's constantly just been better and better and better and better than everybody else? I don't know. Your intuition says yes, but your rational self combined with this might say, actually, it's more complicated than that. And that's one prediction problem, though, is that if she were somebody so special that kept getting smarter and smarter and smarter, unbelievably smarter, maybe she actually has a 4.3 GPA or something, right? Well, our statistical analysis can't predict that because that's outside of the realm of normal, right? That ignores regression to the mean. That's just like a really strange outlier that happens. So the problem is we still have to buy insurance. We still can't take risks on every single kind of investment because we really don't know which ones are gonna tank. So system one is good at doing some extreme predictions and can predict rare events like black swan events on weak evidence, but it also becomes overconfident in the judgments that it makes. It starts to really believe in itself. And system two struggles with things like regression. And it also struggles with finding the winners and the outliers, right? So I'll keep all that in mind when I'm voting on which Xbox number they should make next, or which letter comes next, right? That's one thing I enjoy about, you know, being invested on Robinhood, you get all these emails about, oh, vote in the owner's meeting. I'm like, I should not be an owner of this company because I have no idea what they should be doing. But that brings us back to my old summer with Robinhood, part two. Uh, or how I learned to stop worrying about DD and love the attendees. So this is what I call the Augustan era because it happened in August um, of that fateful summer. So by August, I was up about $300 based on mostly crypto, but then a couple other random lucky guesses. Um, and I gained a healthy fear of it at the same time because remember I had sold almost all of it at a really bad time, but that's another story. But the gambler's itch never really goes away, so I went back to buying. I bought Netflix and Square and Microsoft and Plug Power and Alibaba, you know, the ones that show up on Wall Street bets. Why exactly? Well, what was my intuition saying? It said, hey, people have heard of these things. I've heard of these things. They'll make money, right? Is that based on any analysis? No. Did I do any research? No. Also, I bought like one share of Nikola, but don't worry, I sold it almost immediately. And then I got right back into crypto because I just really couldn't quit at any time. Um, and then I started thinking like, okay, well, what's happening during uh, this pandemic world? Everybody's stuck at home. So I was like, okay, well, they're playing video games, so I'll buy some EA. Uh, they're trying to find love online, so I bought Match. And then they're trying to just buy other crap online besides love. And so I bought some PayPal. Because intuition said, like, well, in a pandemic, people's choices are limited, so let's make money on the choices that they have. But again, like, I didn't do any research into wondering maybe these have already peaked, right? Like, maybe there's no more room for these particular companies to grow. You know, I'm just assuming that somehow there's 
infinite growth. And I'm also assuming that in a pandemic, these really are the things people turn to, which I can't say for a fact, right? Match ended up getting in trouble with Apple, so that was the end of that. Uh, PayPal <laughs> was up for a while, and then it's just way back down again. That's stupid. Why would you buy Pinterest? Why would anyone? I, why would anyone use Pinterest? Why would you buy it? Uh, and EA always sucks. We know that. Nvidia though turned out to be a good tip in the long term. Also, I bought uh, a Yum share because I like Taco Bell. I think I sold it though. So that system too would get warnings like this one. Here was some shareholder information when I tried to buy a little bit of Silver Trust. They said, hey, just as a heads up, if you read through their documentation, they basically say, you will not make any money on this fund. And I was like, oh. And so I eventually sold it as well. I was like, well, thanks for being up front with me. Based on the costs of the fund itself, you know, the fees, and then what Silver actually does, it's like, no, you will not make money on this fund. It's like, great, good to know. Um, and then I got into initial public offerings because if something shows up for the first time and you buy it, it's always gonna go up in the future, right? Well, Rocket Mortgage has never ever turned me a profit for a year and a half or whatever it is. Uh, CureVac, I bought this at the IPO. It went up another 20 bucks that day and I was like, sweet, and sold it, cashed in, right? It's probably worth more than I sold it for now, but you know, that was where I was thinking. Uh, this one turned out to have mandatory corporate action, which didn't actually make it to market for me, but it was good while it lasted. And then it was the month of stock splits. Apple decided to split their stock and Tesla's like, well, we want to split our stock too. Um, and so I was like, okay, cool. I'll buy a share of Tesla and I'll buy a share of Apple and we'll make this happen, right? Because then I'll suddenly have four shares or five shares instead of that. Because intuition says, well, one becoming four means you're getting more money, and one becoming five means you're getting more money, right? Four times as much and five times as much. And system two says, yeah, that's not how math works. This is division, not multiplication. But system one says, I don't remember that from math. Um, Robinhood was helpful, and they actually tried to explain stock splits to me. They said, it's like a pizza. And I was like, great, I love pizza, so I guess I'll buy it, right? They said, no, it's like a pizza that you cut. And I was like, I don't know, I just like pizza. So I bought it. Uh, this guy says, only a great fool would buy Tesla after the stock split and S&P snub. But Papa Elon knows I'm not a great fool and hence created battery day. It's kind of outdated, but I do enjoy it. So with Apple, on that news of the stock split, they were up, 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 up. And then Tesla, same deal, stock split, they went up, 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 up. And then it kind of fell off and then now they're much higher than that. So the lesson I learned was if you use your intuition on the stock market, you're not always going to be wrong because every other idiot out there is actually doing the same thing, aren't they? So your job is not to be correct, it's to hit the correct zeitgeist, right? It's to just be on the front of the wave where everybody else is going to be pushing you forward. If you're at the back of the wave, you're screwed, right? But if you're in front of it, it might work out for a while at least. So in the end, my portfolio became diversified. Um, then I realized I was gonna have to pay taxes and I got very upset. And so by December, I had to make a decision of like, what am I gonna sell? What kind of gains and losses am I gonna lock in? Turned out I lost more money than I thought that year because I ended up not having to pay taxes on it. Uh, so that tells you a lot right there about my investments. And everyone loves to gamble. So of course I bought DraftKings, um, which is its own gamble. Let's say intuitions are 50-50 at best and probably much worse than that, actually. So it brings us back to Nassim Tlaib's black swans, right? So what do we know about black swans? Well, we can't predict them, but they end up changing the future, right? They end up becoming the most important things to so the outliers we don't see. And they also represent the fact that risk is always out there. The safest bet isn't necessarily safe, right? But they can also help you, and that knowledge can help you, because we live in extremistan just to leave, right? We live in the world of extreme things. We don't live in a mediocristan where nothing ever happens. We live in extremistan. And here, Tlaib says, collect as many black swan opportunities as you can, right? So buy all that crypto, buy those NFTs, like buy whatever stocks IPO that you've never heard of right now. I'm not saying that, okay? 
I'm saying that some of those risks will pay off. The problem is you don't know which ones. So take as many as you possibly can and allow for the fact that most of them will end up being losers. And don't be like Willie here and lose all your retirement grease at the last minute. That is not going to be good for your investing. All right. Have a good week. Talk to you later. Don't throw away money that you don't have. So don't buy things on margin. And also don't invest in things that you don't actually know what you're doing. And invest a small enough amount that you can actually get used to what you're doing before you lose it all. Okay, bye-bye.